Benefactor underwriting for this broadcast has been provided by a grant from Republic Bank, The Power of Red is Back. Major underwriting support for this broadcast has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Customers Bank, Collins Building Services, Marks Paneth. Additional underwriting support has been provided by grants from Amtrust Title, Bank of America, Capital One Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC, Handler Real Estate Organization, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Kestamitidis Red Apple Group, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Ocean First Bank, RPW Group, TD Bank, The One Stop Property Group, and these friends. One day I'm going to be a physician. One day I'm going to go to NYU. One day I'm going to get my MD, my master's in science. And one day I'm going to become the vice dean, executive vice president at the NYU Langone Health. Dr. Fritz Francois, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Michael. So tell me a little bit about your father and mother, okay? Well, wow, it's, a, it's a great question, a great place to start, because I can share with you that my father, uh, Mr. Jean Belgard Francois, and my mother, uh, Mrs. Mercelon Blanc, are visionaries. And I use that term because they were individuals who didn't have much. They were, they were not wealthy individuals. But what they had was a passion to help their children get to a place that they couldn't get to. And it was about providing opportunities to their children. And so my parents sacrificed a lot um, in order for them to give those opportunities to their children. So tell me about dad. He was a policeman. He, he believed in education. He really worked hard. But tell me about your dad. Sure. So my father was born in the outskirts, you know, not in the, the capital of, of, of Haiti but in a town um, in, uh, called Okai. And he grew up in an area that was, you know, really had uh, farmers. And his father didn't believe in education as a core thing. He didn't think that that was an important thing because he needed the children to work, including my father, uh, to work on the farm. But even as an early, at an early age, my father really was interested in uh, going to school. And so he would share with me these stories about carrying his shoes for miles so that he doesn't get them dirty, like going through like water, et cetera, just so that he can get to put on those shoes, clean shoes, so that he can go into the schoolhouse on the rare occasions when his father would allow that. And that was a way that he grew up. When he had the opportunity, he did then, uh, when he reached a certain age, he went to Port-au-Prince. And eventually he did join the army. So he was an officer in the army in Haiti and, and before he met my mother. How did he meet your mother? So my mother actually was uh, someone who who's, did not grow up with her, uh, her own mother, who died actually very, very young after giving birth to her. Uh, her father also uh, died at a, when she was fairly young. She was living with some relatives, and there was some mutual acquaintance. And they met, and they dated, and then had a rom early romance. But this was the person who captured his heart. And I think my father, who's al has always been uh, a dreamer and a, and a romantic, saw in this young woman the person with whom he could create a family. So let's talk about you, and let's explain how the name Fritz came about. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, so my name um, it came about in an interesting way, Michael. So 
my parents, after they got married, had uh, two children, um, and they, uh, my father had a, a child before that. So, uh, but at the time, the plan was to come for him to come to the United States, and then would send for my mother and, and eventually the, the two children. Um, when he came to the U.S. and he left, didn't realize that my mother was pregnant with me. And when he got news eventually that not only that my mother was pregnant, but he eventually gave birth to a son, um, he was thinking about a name to give to his son that represented this new country that he was in and somebody very regal. And he wrote a letter uh, the two, that my uncle received, said that he wants his son to be named after um, this person who everybody was talking about around that time, um, which was everybody was talking about John Fitzgerald. Kennedy. However, my uncle misread it and, and didn't understand. He said to himself, well, I've never heard of Fitzgerald, but I've heard of Fritz. And it was an R that was introduced there. And so that's the reason how I got my name. But the intent, the original intent was that I was going to be named after John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who died in, who was assassinated in 1968. And I was born a few years uh, after that. And that's the person my father was hearing. So talk about your father's in America, you're living in Haiti. Yes. Okay, let's talk about those couple of years. I mean, more than a couple of years, but the, for, you hadn't seen your dad in the first three years. Of no, I had not. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was three months old, my mother joined my father here in America and I was left in the custody of, of my grandmother, as well as some uh, relatives, along with my siblings. Uh, and the reason was that they wanted to uh, go ahead and, and, and establish a life here that, and then you know, just make sure that they, they found work, et cetera, and then we would come over. So it, and, and back in those days, it did take time for you to be able to become a, a permanent resident of the United States. There were some requirements in the number of years that you had to be here and also had to have a steady job, et cetera. And it also it was, it was expensive to, be, to try to even go back and forth. And so it wasn't until I was three years old that I had the opportunity to meet my father uh, for the first time in person. And just you could imagine that reunion in this little apartment in Brooklyn, and he gets to see his son for the first time, along with his, uh, his other children. And by then, um, they, my parents actually had another child, you know, my younger sister who was born in, in, um, in the US. But it was an incredible reunion and incredibly emotional for him because he had sacrificed so much with my mother and just working hard every day, saving just for that day when we could all be together. But that was the, the first time that I met my father. So you said to me, each year you'd come back for the summer? That's correct. And so my, the plan thereafter was that, um, my, that we that would go back to Haiti because my parents wanted us to have uh, an education that the type of education um, in Haiti where it's structured differently and we would learn different languages, and et cetera. And in fact, in Haiti, you start school at an earlier age. Um, I started school actually when I was three. The way in which the curriculum is designed, what you do, you're introduced to math and sciences very, very early. And so at least in their mind, that, that foundation was important uh, for us to have. And so we would go to school when it opened, and, but then during the summer when school was out, we would come to the United States and spend time with with your, with your parents. Correct. So you didn't see your parents from the age of three to ten and, unless it was the summer. That's exactly right. So let's talk about the, when you come over at the age of ten. So when we came over, and every time we would come over, it was actually a fascinating um, uh, experience, Michael, because my father, again, being um, a, a dreamer and also just wanting to have, to, to establish what I would call sort of a magical moment for us as children, would always uh, book the flights for the 4th of July. That would be the day when we would be coming to New York. 
And of course, the 4th of July, you can imagine like, you know, the, the fireworks over the bridge. And, and here we're driving through from, from Kennedy Airport and through uh, Brooklyn. And he would say, this is all for you. And being young, we loved it. We thought, wow, this is amazing. Look at all this pomp and circumstance because we are here and we've arrived in the United States. So every year there was this aspect that, you know, that the, the fireworks in 4th of July was specifically for us. So how is it arriving at 10 years of age to Brooklyn, New York, to near East 58th Street, I believe, That's right? right? How? That's it was, you know, there, there was an, as, uh, an aspect of this which was both uh, exciting, but also quite foreign, uh, you know, not only because of the language, but the acculturation beyond the, the household, which, of course, you know, they, you know we were glad to have, but my, uh, my parents were there and, and my siblings, and that was great. But it was really understanding the culture, trying to now fit in to, with everything that was going on, whether the clothes, the, the music, even the language, which was, uh, you know, which was challenging. And then starting school in, in Brooklyn with uh, all these uh, you know, different cultures that were there, et cetera. So that was certainly a challenge uh, to, uh, to be a culture, to try to acculturate to that. And for me, the most important element uh, that I sort of held on to uh, were so, you know, the, the fundamentals of math and science, like especially math, which was a universal language. So even though I, I couldn't speak English very well at the time, but certainly I, I understood math. And that helped me in terms of my progression. So let's talk about it. You had some jobs, and then we have a photo, I believe, of you worked in like a mom and pop store. Yeah, so there were various uh, uh, jobs that I, that I worked, uh, worked in, including um, a hardware shop where I learned how to, not too far away from where I lived in, on, on, um, in uh, East 58th Street in, in Brooklyn, where it was a little row, it was a row house. And uh, on Ralph Avenue, was this particular hardware store, and then there was also not too far away a little deli, like a you know, which was a mom and pop shop, actually called the Milky Way. But those sorts of odds and ends, actually, were what we did. So, when did you have, uh, as someone would say, the calling that you wanted to go into medicine? Well, you know, the uh, I would say I was always interested in the sciences, but there was a there was a moment in which I knew that this was going to be a path that I wanted to follow because there was a purpose, there was the why you know, to, to what I was going to do. And that came about uh, when I was in high school. Uh, I chose to, to write a, a paper about HIV and AIDS. So this is now back in the 80s. And my parents had purchased for us a, a, you know, a set of uh, encyclopedia. The World Book Encyclopedia. The World Book Encyclopedia. And I'm reading about HIV and AIDS, and there's a specific paragraph. Four H's, correct? The four H's. And the four H's of who gets HIV and AIDS. And they were homosexuals, hemophiliacs, heroin users, and the fourth H, Haitians. Haitians. And can you imagine the impact on this young kid reading this, saying, what in the world? By virtue of the fact that I'm Haitian, I have AIDS? Now, I mean, immediately knew that that was wrong. Just didn't make any sense. And my reaction was to think, well, you know, I'm not sure who's, who, who wrote that in this book, but I need to be the one writing these types of articles. And I need to be the one who's helping to uncover the correct information uh, because of the fact that this information made it not only in the World Book Encyclopedia, but also elsewhere in, in the, the medical literature, that Haitians were banned from giving blood. There was also a, the impact on the entire community where people lost their jobs and they were ostracized. There are school children actually who were made fun of or were beat up because of the fact that they were Haitian and that it was, they were told that they were the ones who were bringing AIDS. 
this ban that was put in place uh, impacted an entire community. And it led to eventually one of the biggest marches across the Brooklyn Bridge to City Hall to demand that this particular law be rescinded, and it was eventually. Uh, but that was one of the things that drove me and, and, and gave me purpose as to why I wanted to go into medicine. Now, was, what, when was Roswell Park? So Roswell Park, I had the opportunity to, to go to uh, when I was a junior, between my junior and senior year in high school. So I went to high school in, uh, in Midwood, I went to Midwood High School um, in, the, in the medical science um, institute, as it was called, uh, in, at Brooklyn College. So it was Midwood High School at Brooklyn College with the medical science program. And I went to Roswell Park uh, that summer, spent eight weeks doing research in smoking cessation. And it was an you know, amazing experience. You can imagine a kid growing up who grew up in Brooklyn now going up to Roswell Park in, in Buffalo, Buffalo <laughs> exactly, and being in this uh, you know research center and engaging with these scientists and these physicians and doing research and just getting a sense of what this might be like, and so that was an amazing experience. What about the ride over the Brooklyn Bridge one day in the NYU sign? Yeah, so, you know, I, it, that was actually coming back from Roswell Park, um, and I was on the, uh, the FDR, the county side of, of Man Manhattan, and my, parent, my father had picked me up with my brother from the uh, train station, and I was dead tired and just leaning back on, you know, the, uh, the back seat of the car. And there was some traffic, as, you, as there usually is on the FDR. And as we neared... Uh, around 34th Street, about on the east side, I remember looking up slightly uh, to my right and I saw a sign, uh, which was a big purple sign, a circle, and it was the NYU Medical Center. And I didn't say anything out loud, but I certainly thought to myself, wouldn't it be amazing if one day I get to work there? And I just tuck that away as an idea. So let's talk, because we're going to talk about the commencement when you graduated Midwood and you go to NYU. That's right. But tell me about your parents, what they struggled with to pay for this and to later on at the commencement speak. Sure. Well, my parents uh, were not wealthy individuals. My, my father was, a, uh, was part of the custodial staff, the building services staff at the World Trade Center. And my mother worked as, uh, you know, clean houses, like, you know, and, and uh, every day. And she mo uh, usually uh, at times she, there, there are weeks that she worked uh, six, you know, six or even seven days a week uh, cleaning homes. And so they did not have a lot of money. But what they had was uh, a lot of passion, dedication, commitment to their children. My mother would work during the day. And my father worked at night just to make sure that there was always one parent who was with us in the house. And so we were very rich from the perspective of the attention that they gave to us and the culture that they imparted to us, the discipline that they gave to us. But at the time that I went to the NYU, was, um, I got uh, scholarships and you know, also took out like some, uh, some loans. Uh, but my parents uh, did the best they can to also uh, try to support the children in terms of money to buy books, but it was expensive. And so one of the, fortunately I did well in school and I was a Larry Silverstein scholar and that helped uh, a great deal in terms of uh, being able to afford NYU. So let's talk about the commencement. Mm -hmm. You're selected to speak at your commencement and your parents are sitting in the audience. That was an amazing moment uh, because, you know, uh, having, I, usually, I tell people all the time when I'm interviewed that how proud I am to be the immigrant son of immigrants. And came, I had the opportunity to, uh, to go to NYU and worked hard and was selected to be the commencement speaker. And 
had the chance to address the crowd at Washington Square Park. And there are two individuals who are in seats of, of honor to my right. And they are my parents. And you could imagine how proud they were. So let's talk about the NYU medical school time mm -hmm. and then talk a little bit about how you got into gastroenterology. Yeah. And then the continuation, I just want to make sure that in the next five minutes, I, I don't miss much. Sure. So, I, so after I went to NYU undergrad, I had, the, uh, I, I, I had the opportunity to go to NYU School of Medicine. I got accepted early to medical school, uh, to NYU School of Medicine. And very early on in that period of time, I, I was interested in actually in doing research. And I came up to the medical center and, and, and did some research. I, and I continued on actually at the medical school, all through medical school actually had done research. I decided uh, because of the, the, the fact that I got such a great uh, education there and my experience there actually was wonderful with the physicians that I engaged with that I wanted to continue my training at NYU. And so I did. I did my internship, residency, as well as a chief and, residency. And your master's. And my master's, actually, eventually at, uh, at NYU. And I got into gastroenterology. I decided to do a fellowship in gastroenterology as a field because I was intrigued with the notion that you could blend internal medicine. You could have a field that blends internal medicine with procedures. Uh, without having to do incisions, et cetera, but you can use instruments in order to look inside the body and to care for patients in various ways that, you know, that need it. And so it, it, it was uh, a, a terrific experience actually to be able to develop those skills. And as I said, I, because of my interest in research, I also pursued a master's of science uh, in uh, investigation. And, I, and I, as a fellow, I had the chance to write my first NIH grant. And all of this actually is because um, throughout my, my time at NYU, I realized that the medical center as well as the, the, uh, like in, uh, as well as the hospital actually had, was growing so much in terms of the way in which they developed opportunities for trainees as well as faculty to continue their professional development. And that's, that has remained to this day terms of what happens at a place like NYU Langone Health. Okay, we're going to continue on NYU, but I want to talk about the earthquake, 2011. So the earthquake uh, was, uh, was, was a, um, to say the least, a, a, a devastating occurrence for the country. But as soon as I, I remember actually coming out of uh, the end, uh, doing procedures and towards the end of the day, and my phone rang and somebody said, have you heard? I said, what, what's going on? And, and I got the news. And immediately I knew that um, I, I wanted to do something and it wasn't just gonna be from afar. I wanted to go there. But I had not been back since I was 10 years old. And I felt in my heart of hearts that everything that I had done from the time that I was 10, all my education, all my training in medicine, had led me to that moment where now I wanted to go back and to help out however I can. And what happened next is, is that uh, the dean and the CEO, uh, Dr. Robert Grossman, supported the effort, in fact, asked me to, to uh, lead a team from NYU to go to Haiti on a relief mission, which we did. And I ended up uh, going to L'Hôpital Général, which is one of the biggest the, the hospital in, uh, the, in Port-au-Prince. And the NYU team helped to open up the operating rooms again. And I helped to take care of patients in the, the intensive care unit. It was the only unit where the patients were not outdoors because there was such fear of the aftershocks that all the patients, by and large, were in the courtyard. And you can imagine the hot sun, and, but you had the patients there because they felt safer there. But there were other patients who were so sick in the intensive care unit that they couldn't be moved out. But this was a moment in which you could, you know, they're trying to get medicines and oxygen and all that actually was, it was, it was uh, going. A couple, we have like a minute and a half left. <coughs> 
tell me about how you met your wife and tell me about your son and then we're going to get back to the administration right. at NYU. So I met my wife in church and she convinced me to join a choir. Actually, it was in uh, St. Vincent Ferry Church in Brooklyn. And she convinced me to, to join uh, the choir. We became friends. And uh, we were friends uh, you know, for many years and dated um, and eventually got, got married right after I graduated from medical school. And about a year later, we were blessed with a son, Donovan. So um, this uh, was part of our story. OK. How, tell, tell me about the latest promotion. I mean, you've been involved with many. The vice dean. So I am now uh, serving as the uh, executive vice president, uh, the vice dean, and the chief of hospital operations at NYU Langone Health. You know, it's nice for a kid, you know, who grew up in <laughs> Haiti originally, who never came here until 10 <laughs> to grow to the level. And you've been involved with major efforts in diversity over there. Mm -hmm. And um, I think one great comment, there was an article that you penned with your associate saying black lives matter, but more, imp more important, people's lives matter. That's right. And I think you are a great person. I'm very happy you joined me today. Thank you. Thank you so much.